grace and mercy. So I ask that you bless each and every individual who is in here today. Every person who's watching the live stream, every person in our community and within our world to know that there is a God and a God who loves and a God who gives grace and mercy. Allow the person who is in here right now who's watching that does not know that, that they believe that that sin is too much for your love. Allow them to know that you accept them, that you love them and do not judge them and that you are there for them in their life. We thank you for that. We thank you for your grace and mercy. And we sing and praise all the hallelujahs and praises to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all see this next song with us is called Indescribable, which is a perfect way to, to, to see more about our Lord and Savior.
and in him is no darkness at all. Can I get an amen? If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, join with me as we confess our sins together. O oh, humble, my humble Savior, do not let pride swell in my heart. My nature is like the mud beneath my feet and the dust where I will return. Every ability of my mind and body is an undeserved gift of your grace. Help me to see myself in the light of your glory. Then my pride will wither, decay, and die before you. Humble my heart before you. How can I boast to myself with pride? When I meet responsibilities incomplete, may the thought of this lead me to Deepen in me a commitment to your service, and awaken to me a more thoughtful desire for holiness. When I am tempted to think highly of myself, help me to see the deceitful power of my spiritual enemy. When I fall into sin, help me hide myself in Jesus' righteousness. And when I am victorious in a battle with temptation, May I give all credit and glory to you for your grace. Keep me humble, meek and lowly, and always depend on you. Amen. Now I hear these words from comfort from verse John uh, 1, verse 9. The verse says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now join us in personal prayer. Please take a moment for personal reflection, repentance, and prayer, either individually or with a few others around you. Summer in the Psalms, which is a beautiful name for our sermon series this summer. Um, one of the things we've been doing is breaking down the scripture each week. This week is Psalm 53, and um, after listening to it and meditating, we found that it worked very well with uh, before the throne. So uh, I think most of you know that uh, song, so sing with us and uh, praise the Lord along with itself. Just 
Good morning. Welcome again to Christ Community Church. My name is Ken Suits. I'm the pastor here at Christ Community Church. It's good to be with you here this morning. I just have a few announcements to make before we continue in worship through the reading and preaching of God's Word. The first is if you are new to Christ Community Church, then we welcome you and we're glad you're here with us. If you have not before filled out one of these welcome cards, would you please do that just to let us know who you are and uh, just to have a few basic points of information so that we can send you a greeting card. We'd like to welcome you and thank you for worshiping with us. So if you would like to do that, uh, we would like to uh, be able to send that greeting to you. Another announcement is this coming Wednesday at 630, we'll have our time of prayer together. And then at 7 o'clock, our Bible study together. As a, as a fellowship time. So if you would like to join us for prayer and Bible study, that's uh, every other Wednesday we do that. And so this Wednesday we'll meet again in the back building, the fellowship room at 6.30 and then at 7 o'clock. And then my final announcement as a, another reminder is that our baseball fellowship time is coming up in a couple of weeks. That's going to be on uh, Friday, July 16th at 7 p.m. I've already had several people let me know that they are planning to go. I, I am going to end up having to order a few extra tickets, so if I really need to know by this week for sure if you're coming uh, so that I can get all those tickets ahead of time and make sure we have those spots available. So I believe um, many of you have confirmed that, but I'm still waiting to hear on a few people kind of a definite yes or no before I order those final tickets. So please let me know. Preferably by you know, the next couple days so I can give them a call and let them know how many more tickets we need. 
That's all I got by way of announcements. You see there, uh, there's also an announcement in your bulletin about our prayer ministry, and you can refer to your worship guide for information on that. Now, as we continue to worship through prayer and through the reading and preaching of the word, would you join with me as I pray our kingdom prayer together? Father, we praise you and we thank you for your steadfast love, which we have already sung about and that we will continue to sing about. And we thank you and praise you that you demonstrated your love for us by sending Jesus. That Jesus, you were the willing servant who came and humbled yourself before us. And as we just confessed, we have no place for boasting. Not in ourselves, not in what we've done, not in the people that we participate in and with, not in our relationships, and not even in the places where we live and have citizenship. Lord, we are thankful that you have put us in a country where we can worship you freely, that we can do that without fear of persecution or physical suffering. And we thank you for that, that you have provided a place for us to do that here in this building through the gracious um, generosity of people who have had uh, the kingdom on their mind and your church in their priorities, that they have given us this building to be able to worship you. We thank you for that. We thank you for a town and a, and a state and a country where we can worship you freely without fear of being caught, of being found out like many of our brothers and sisters throughout the world. We thank you that we don't have to plan secretly to be here today like many of our fellow Christians throughout the world. And so we praise you for that. We pray that we would not take that lightly, that we would be thankful for that because you have given that to us. And we thank you that we can be in a country where we celebrate that freedom together. Lord, I, I thank you and praise you that you also have promised to meet with us by your Spirit. And that your Spirit was promised by Jesus to indwell believers, to live inside of us, to make us aware of our sin, to make us aware of your holiness, to help us walk in holiness through repentance and faith and new obedience. And Lord, when we don't do that, that your Spirit also assures us that we are still children of God, that we don't lose our status because of our sin, but that you forgive us, that you have declared us righteous through faith in Jesus Christ because of his work on the cross, not our own works, because of his righteousness which was earned, not our sin which we have earned, and because of his deliverance from punishment instead of what we've deserved, which is your judgment. And so, Lord, we thank you for your spirit that works in us in that way. Pray now as we come to the reading of your word, that even as I open your word and read from it, that your spirit would take these words that were inspired by him and write them on our hearts. Speak to our hearts and show us the truth of these things that we will be uh, discussing and, and thinking of this morning. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would also, through the preaching, uh, speak to your people this morning and awaken those who are not your people to the truth of your word, that they too might become your people. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Many times when you hear a song on the radio, you might hear a song where you hear the words or you hear the tune and you think, that's, that's really catchy. I really like that. that. That sounds good. And then as you start paying attention to the lyrics, you realize, wow, there's a lot of meaning in these lyrics. And then if you uh, get curious, you might even look up the artist, or you might look up what, what led to this person writing this song. Uh, there's a song that many of you may know that was popular in the last um, about five to seven years ago. It was pretty popular, I think. It's about the time frame. It was called How to Save a Life by the Fray. And I used to really love, I mean, I love this. I'll still 
still like the song. It's really catchy. It's got a really um, neat message. It wouldn't be considered a Christian song, but it's got a really good message. Um, well, I was just this past week, I, I was looking up different songs with backstories, and I read this, the backstory of this particular song, and it, man, it hit me hard. It really made me think about the suffering and the sadness that this particular artist had gone through, which really led him to writing the lyrics of this song. And without going into too many details, essentially what happened was a friend of his who he had loved and counseled and uh, tried to help through um, battles with depression ended up taking their own life. And in response to that situation, he wrote this song, How to Save a Life. And uh, it's really powerful when you know the backstory to then go back and look at the lyrics. And the same is true for many of the songs that we sing in the church. You might not know some of the backstories to some of our favorite hymns, some of our favorite songs. For, for example, a well-known hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, was written by a guy named Horatio Bonner. And following the death of his daughters who had gone overseas uh, on a ship, and the ship crashed in all. All three of his daughters on that ship died. And in response to this horrific situation, he wrote the hymn, It is well with my soul. And so you think about that situation when he says, when sorrows like sea billows roll, you start to imagine exactly what he's feeling. In the same way, we sing some hymns here called, There is a fountain filled with blood and heal us, Emmanuel. These were written by William Cooper. William Cooper battled with depression and attempted suicide for most of his adult life. And then when you start paying attention to those hymn lyrics, you start to realize, wow, he's really writing these from his heart. When, he, when he's writing, heal us Emmanuel, he means it. When he writes at the end of his verse that we sing, he says, when this poor stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, I will sing of your praises evermore. He's talking about his physical tongue. It, it said that he actually did um, suffer from stuttering and from anxiety that led him to have a re really difficult time speaking, and yet he was one of the most poetic writers of his time. And he, in his song, writes that. He's putting himself on the page. And then one final song that we sing here, Amazing Grace, that many of you know, was written by John Newton. John Newton was a former slave trader, used to captain the ships that traded the slaves, and he came to know Christ, and he repented of all of that, and then became a part of leading the, the freedom of slaves. And when he wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace, it said that he was trying to find a tune that would best speak to his repentance, and many people believe that the, the tune for the hymn, Amazing Grace, is actually a tune that he would have heard on the slave ships being sung by the slaves underneath the deck. That it goes back to tunes that are very familiar and sound very familiar to African tunes. And so when you sing Amazing Grace, you're most likely singing a tune that at one point was sung by slaves on a ship. Doesn't that make it even that much more powerful to think of those things? And so when, when he says things like, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining up into the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. When he says, amazing grace has saved a wretch like me, he means it. You see how the backstory of songs often give us the context that we need to best understand them? Well, this morning, we come to Psalm 52, and we're actually told the backstory. If you look at the top of your psalm there, Psalm 52, you actually see there that it says that this was written to the choir master, a maskil. That's probably a, a type of song, um, a maskil of David. So it's written by David. And then it tells us, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul... David has come to the house of Ahimelech. 
Now, for someone reading their Bible or reading their Psalms and they see that, that might mean nothing to you. And so what you would have to do is take out your Bible and try to figure out, okay, where did this story happen? And so if you were to go back, we're not going to read through these chapters. If you were to go back, you can write this down if you want, to 1 Samuel chapter 21 and 22. That's the story that they're talking about here. And so I just want to kind of give you the background of this psalm, because I think the backstory, like we were just talking about with those psalms, really gives us a context and helps us understand more what David is really writing here. And so here's what was going on. David was on the run. He was running away from Saul, who was trying to kill him. Saul saw, Saul saw David as a threat to the throne. Saul was the king, and David had been anointed as the next king, and so he was a threat. He's not part of my family. Jonathan is Saul's son, the, the one who would be assumed to be the heir to the throne. And yet here is David, um, who has been told he's going to be the king. And so Saul tries to get David. He tries to go and kill him and persecute him and get him out of threat's way. So David's on the run. David goes to Ahimelech, who is a priest. And he goes to Ahimelech, trying to find shelter. And so Ahimelech takes care of David. And David says, I'm hungry. I haven't been able to eat. I haven't been able to get food. And Ahimelech says, I, well, I don't have any food here. The only food I have is the bread of presence, which is in the temple. Um, have some of that. And so David eats this bread. Well... This is where Doeg, who is a servant of Saul, uh, finds out that David is here and that Ahimelech has sheltered David. So Doeg goes and tells Saul that Ahimelech has sheltered David, this fugitive who's on the run. And so Saul goes and confronts Ahimelech, the priest, about this. Now up to this point in this story... We're on David's side and we're on Ahimelech's side because we understand Saul, what Saul is doing is wrong. He's going after, after the Lord's anointed. He's going after the one that God himself has said, this is going to be the next king. Saul's trying to take him out. Ahimelech is doing the right thing. He's, he's protecting David who is unjustly being accused and being chased down in attempted murder. So Ahimelech is doing the right thing. He is watching out for those who are oppressed. He's taking care of the one who's being persecuted. He's, he's protecting the one whose life is in danger. And so Ahimelech and David, they're really on the right side. Well, Saul confronts David, or confronts Ahimelech, and Doeg is there. And what happens in 1 Samuel 22 is that Saul commands Doeg to slaughter Ahimelech. And all of the priests that are serving with Ahimelech because of what they've done. They've gone against what the government has said to do, the king, in order to protect this life of David. And because of that, they have suffered. But when David finds out what has happened, that all these people have been killed because of taking care of him, you can imagine how he feels about that. He's sad. He's angry. He even has feelings of guilt. And then that's the situation that we get Psalm 52. That, that's what I want you to be feeling and thinking as we come to this psalm. That's what David's writing about. And as you'll see in the, in the what we've already sung, as you were singing, you're like, probably thinking, why are we singing this? This sounds kind of harsh, right? But that's really what David's feeling. It's what he's thinking. And so let's come to Psalm 52 and read this. Why do you boast of evil? O oh, mighty man, the steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking what is right. Selah. You love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, 
See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of Lord God, as we come to this psalm, which at first might seem a little confusing, and, and how does the first part of this apply to us and to me? Would you give us understanding, and then would you speak to our hearts the truth of your steadfast love? Amen. <clears throat> so David's situation here is that he has faced suffering and persecution and false accusation and injustice and even has witnessed murder and sadness. He's, he's feeling sadness and guilt. And in all of this, regardless of all these terrible things that he's witnessing, he can still say, God's steadfast love will endure through all of this situation. And that's really what I want you to get from this, the main message of this this morning, is that God's steadfast love will keep you forever. God's steadfast love will keep you forever. Now, we're going to look at this in two points this morning. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7. We're going to just talk about the fact that in this world, you will face hardship. Jesus said this, right? In this world, you will have trouble and tribulation. But then in the second point, we'll see that in light of this, and even in spite of this, that God's steadfast love is forever. God's steadfast love is forever. So this really reflects Jesus' own promise, right? In this world you will have trouble, but I leave you my peace. Well, in this psalm we're going to see that you will face hardships, but even in the inside of those things, God's steadfast love is forever. So look at your psalm again. Look at, let's just kind of walk through some of those things. Verses 1 through 7, what we see, and if we remember David's situation, he's this really, I mean, if you know the situation, you can pretty much guess David's kind of writing this towards Saul. He's saying, why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? Well, Saul's the king, right? That's a pretty mighty person. That's a pretty high position of power. Why are you boasting of evil, Saul? Why are you boasting of evil, you wicked rulers and leaders? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. You can almost sense David right from the beginning. He's saying, oh my goodness, look at our world. Look at what's happening in our world. I know none of y'all have said that any time recently, right? <laughs> look at what's happening, all this evil that's going on. And what's David's immediate response? God's love is still there. Even in the midst of this evil suffering, even in the midst of all of these people, even leaders who are leading us against what God's word says is right and true, even in light of those things, the steadfast love of God endures. And so we see this, David really is responding in faith, even though the words seem kind of harsh at first when we read them, David's responding to his situation with faith. He's, he's trusting in God's steadfast love. And then he goes on to point out things like your tongue plots destruction. Remember, Saul commanded Doeg to commit this awful act of murder. Your tongue plots destruction. You love evil more than good. Your lying is more, is, is, you, and you love lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour. You have a deceitful tongue. But then look what David says. He says, but God will break you down forever. He will snatch you and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. So David, he's trusting in God's steadfast love that even as he faces suffering, he's believing God's love will never fail. I'm trusting in and then he's also trusting in God's justice. Do you see that? He's saying God will ultimately execute justice on the evil of 
this world. If leaders of our country promote what is wrong and what is evil, God promises he will execute justice one day. He will remove people from those places of power and authority. It might not happen in our, in our world or in our lifetime, but God promises vengeance is mine. You remember that? That, that it, it's not for you, oh man, to seek revenge or to seek vengeance, or even if people are persecuting, it's not even your place to wish evil upon them, but God promises, I will bring about justice. It will happen, God says. He promises that. And David is trusting in that. So David, throughout his psalms, you actually can go back to Exodus 34. I know I said this last week. I'm going to say it more. But David is really trusting in God's own description of himself. God in Exodus 34 says, I am a God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And so David is saying, I'm trusting in your steadfast love. But later in that same passage, Exodus 34, God says, but who will by no means clear the guilty, but I will come and I will punish them for the sins of their fathers and their fathers' fathers to the third to, to the third and fourth generation. So God also, in the same passage that he promises to be a gracious and merciful God, also promises that he is a just God. And he will punish evil for what it deserves. So David is trusting in that in this psalm. Do you see that? And so what do we want to take away from this? Well, I don't know if you know the story of the Tin Booms, Corey Tin Boom and her sister Betsy, but they were, uh, they actually harbored, they took care and hid Jews during the time of persecution of the Jews in Nazi Poland. They hid the Jews in their own house, and they were found out. They were caught. And uh, the men were separated from the women. The men were taken to one facility where they died. Her father died. She found out. She didn't even get to say goodbye. Her and her sister were put into a concentration camp. And through that time, uh, her sister, Betsy, suffered with illness, was, had extreme malnutrition, and her body just wasn't able to endure as well as her sister was, Corey Tim Boone. And so according to Boom and her story about this called The Hiding Place, she's, it's, it's really an autobiography, and she's talking about a conversation that she has with her sister Betsy. And Betsy's faith, the way Corey to Boone um, really just narrates Betsy's faith is incredible. I mean, through all of this suffering, she is trusting in God's faithfulness and steadfast love and, and really sovereignty, believing that God is totally in control, even in the midst of this evil suffering. And at one point in that book, Corey quotes Betsy and says this. Betsy was saying this. When a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. And that's what she was able to say that even in the midst of her suffering, going through this terrible dark time. And later when Corey was writing about this and reflecting back on it, the fact that her sister had died and she had been able to escape and now she, and, and then shared her story with others. She said, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. And so in the midst of their suffering and in their darkness, they were still able to believe in God's promises that his steadfast love would never fail. So just to apply this and think about this. What suffering have you gone through, or will you go through, or are you ready to go through? And in that suffering, were you able to remind yourself and remember and believe, or are you preparing to tell yourself that even in the midst of this suffering, God's love never fails? His steadfast love is sure, and I can trust in that. No matter what I'm going through, I can trust in that. I'll just speak from personal testimony. I think one of the worst things that uh, society and that, um, I'll just say it, that our government has approved in our country is abortion. It's a terrible evil. It's sin and it's murder against innocent lives. 
lives, what we could call innocent lives, who cannot defend themselves. And sometimes standing up against that will cause us to be looked down on and to be persecuted. And in light of those things, kind of like Ahimelech did, right? We can defend them. And like David did after the fact, we can mourn for those things. And even in the midst of those things, we should speak against it. We should preach against it. We should pray against it. But even in the midst of this evil, God's steadfast love endures. We might not understand what he's doing and why he allows things like this to happen, but God's love endures. And you can, you can apply that to many different things. The slaves and those who went through the civil rights movement, this was their constant theme. God's love endures. Even in the midst of my suffering, God's love endures. And they would place their hope on God's justice. And God will execute justice one day, even in the midst of this evil. And so are you trusting in God's love and in God's justice? That's really what David is doing here. And are you able to say that God will one day execute justice on those who boast in their evil, like Saul was doing and like David is writing about? So that, let's move now from that into kind of the more positive part of this song, okay? So look at verses 8 through 9. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. And I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the God. So let's just look at a few things that David's saying here. First, first of all, he's, again, he's reminding himself that I am going to trust in the steadfast love of God. God has promised that he is a God who is gracious and merciful and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. I'm going to trust that. As difficult as that is at times, that's what I'm trusting in, God's own promise. And because I trusted that, I'm going to thank him for that. I'm going to thank him for that love. That's really what worship and praise is all about, is responding to God because of who he is and what he's done for us. And so he says that, I'm going to thank you forever, I'm going to praise you forever, I'm going to trust you forever. And let's not just skip over that phrase forever. For those who are in Christ, you literally are going to praise God forever. On this earth and in the life to come, your entire life will be revolved around worshiping and praising and thanking God for what he's done. Isn't that a neat thing to think about? So this past week, I was um, in St. Louis for our whole denominations gathering. Um, there was some business to take care of, but there was also times of worship. And we there in that room, there was anywhere from 2,000 to about 2,500 people worshiping together. And the most powerful moment of that whole week, many people testified, was really the first night of worship. It was Tuesday night where the whole place was singing, holy, holy, holy. And at one point, they just went completely, no instruments, only the voices, and it was powerful. 2,000 plus people singing, holy, holy, holy. And that's what heaven's going to be like. And it was powerful. It's going to be way better than that. And it's going to be powerful. And that's Amazing Grace. Again, I said Amazing Grace. One of my favorite lines. I've said it before. When we've been there 10,000 years. You can't even imagine being alive for 10,000 years, right? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing 34. And I'm like, man, this is, a, this is taking a while. Yeah? And then others are thinking, boy, yeah, that's nothing. Um, we feel like we've been here for a little while here on earth. When we've been there 10,000 years. Bright shining as the sun, John Newton said, we know less days to sing God's praise than when we first died. We're going to be singing God's praise for 10,000 years plus. It's going to be awesome. Forever really means forever. I will trust and I will thank you for your steadfast love forever. And then I will dwell in your house. He says, I'm going to dwell in your house forever. In Psalm 23, verse 6. So we're going to be with the Lord forever. Why? Why are we going to thank Him? Why are we going to praise Him? He says, because you have done it. He has done what? He has saved us. The work of salvation is God's work. It's not based on what you do. It's not even based on the fact that you figured it out. God in His grace, we just confess this together. God in His grace has...
has his people, and he's the one that causes them to come to saving faith. Salvation is of the Lord. He has done it. And he has primarily done it by sending his son, Jesus. The one who came and lived on earth and died on the cross for our sins because we couldn't save ourselves. God did it. He accomplished salvation for his people. It's, it's totally grace. And so because these things are true, what David says, I will wait. I'm going to be patient. In the midst of my sadness, in the midst of my suffering, in the, in the midst of this dark tunnel, I'm going to trust the engineer knows what he's doing. 